The matter as to what are the signs that indicate you are going to heaven is confusing to many and our generation seeks clarity on this topic. So we will throw some light on this topic so we can get some things right. Then you can be sure you're a heaven qualified candidate. So what are the signs then? You may ask. Well, let us take a look at them. Sign number one, been born again by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, what has been born again. Let's take a view from the word of God in the book of John chapter three, verse three through to six, Jesus answered him. I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, that unless a person is born again or anew, from above a ye cannot ever see, no, be acquainted with and experience the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb again and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, unless a man is born of water and even the spirit, he cannot ever enter the kingdom of God. What is born of from the flesh is flesh or of the physical, is physical and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Now for clarity's sake, about what Jesus meant by born of water and of the spirit in the scripture we read, let's take a look on what Jesus meant. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 25 through to 26 it says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols will I cleanse you, a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall heed my ordinances and do them. So we see at the book of Ezekiel, there was a breakdown on how one is born of water and of the spirit. The only way a man can be born of water and of the spirit is by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. Jesus is captured as the way, the truth and the life in the book of John chapter 14, verse 6, which says Jesus explained, e, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes next to the Father except through union with me. To know me is to know my Father too. Now let's break down the way, the truth, and the life. Firstly, the way. He is not one way among many, but the only way there is. It was not his disciples, but he himself who insisted he was the only way to God's presence. To be true to him, his disciples must teach the same thing that. It was also pointed to that he is the way in this scripture, Acts chapter 4 verse 12, and there is no salvation through any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He was pointed to as the only way to salvation, and without being saved, we can't see God's kingdom. Also another scripture pointing to him as the way to the Father who is in heaven is the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, for there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This points out to the fact that Jesus is the only way to the Father who dwell in heaven. Many people do not like this teaching of Jesus, but not liking it will not change it. Far better it is to decide to like it, because Jesus is the truth and does not lie. He himself said that he is the only Son of God, in whom there is access to eternal life through believing in him, which is the only way we receive that eternal life. We see this in John chapter 3 verse 16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We see him as the one who is the way by which we must go through to receive and inherit spiritual life in John chapter 6 verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He is the one men must believe or else be lost forever. Jesus is referred to as the only door the door here also signifies the way for God's people, and the only shepherd in the book of John chapter 10 verse 7 through to 11. Then Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door for the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved, and go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life, and that they might have it in great abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Let us believe him because of who he is, and because of the evidence he has shown. Secondly, he is the truth. The Lord Jesus is the embodiment of God's truth. The incarnation of the God of truth, we can see even the patriarch David referred to him as the God of truth in the book of Psalms chapter 31, verse 5 into your hands. I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. God of truth is one of God's precious names. 
He is absolutely true to his word. It is impossible for him to lie. There is not the slightest hint of deception, guile, or darkness in him. And it is he who said that he is the truth who said that he is the way. Life. John chapter 11 verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet he will live. This does not mean, of course, physical existence. And he is not at all saying that in some way he is the life of all men and all creatures. He is saying that he shares the life of the one true God. In John chapter 5 verse 26 he says, For just as the Father has life in himself, if so he is given to the Son to have life in himself. And he is the one who gives eternal life to men. In John chapter 5 verse 21 he says, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, just so the Son gives life to whom he will. Also in John chapter 17 verse 2, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this life is in him alone. We see this in the book of 1 John chapter 5 verse 11 through to 12. And this is the record. God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. By receiving and accepting the Lord Jesus into our hearts and lives by faith, all that he is becomes ours, and we are in the way, believe the truth and have life. If we reject him, we will never be in the way to God, or believe the truth, or have eternal spiritual life, or arrive in peace in the presence of God in heaven. We may be certain of this, because we have the word of the Son of God, who is Jesus himself. Sign number two, holy and righteous living according to the Bible. Righteousness is not just a moral standard, but a transformative way of living that aligns us with God's divine will. Stay with us as we journey through the scriptures to understand why living a righteous life is a powerful sign that we're on the road to heaven. What do we understand by righteousness to grasp the significance of living a righteous life? We turn to Proverbs chapter 21, verse 21. Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life. Righteousness and honour, righteousness, in biblical terms, means aligning our actions, thoughts and intentions with God's moral principles. It involves integrity, honesty and a sincere desire to follow God's commands. The source of righteousness. We learn that righteousness comes through Jesus Christ. We see this in Philippians chapter 1 verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Through our faith in Christ, we receive the grace that empowers us to live righteously. It is through our connection with him that we gain the strength and wisdom to make choices that honour God. Righteousness and love righteousness and love are linked togetherness. As stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6 love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. A righteous life is rooted in love for God and love for our neighbours. It prompts us to treat others with kindness, compassion, and respect, reflecting the love that God has bestowed upon us. Righteousness and justice. Living righteously involves standing for justice and fairness. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 15 emphasizes the importance of justice when justice is done. It brings joy to the righteous but terror to evildoers. Upholding justice, defending the oppressed, and working towards a fair society are key components of a righteous life and mirroring God's sense of justice. Righteousness and humility Proverbs chapter 22 verse 4 teaches us. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honour and life. A righteous life is marked by humility, recognising our dependence on God, acknowledging our flaws and being open to his guidance. Humility keeps us grounded and receptive to God's transformative work in our lives. In summary, living a righteous life is not a mere religious obligation. It's a profound sign of our relationship with God. It's a testament to our faith, our love for others, our commitment to justice, and our humility before the Creator. As we strive to live righteously, we walk a path that leads us closer to heaven, for it is through righteousness that we reflect the very nature of God. As sign number three, yieldedness to the Holy Spirit yieldedness, or surrendering to the guidance and influence of the Holy Spirit, is a major sign of a genuine relationship with God. We were given a promise of the Holy Spirit who is to direct and guide us in our path to heaven. We can see this in the book of John chapter 14 verse 16 through to 17, where Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, 
for he dwells with you and will be in you. This promise shows the essential role of the Holy Spirit in guiding believers. The believer's yieldedness in submission to God's will, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, reminds us, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Yieldedness involves submitting our will to God's divine plan, allowing the Holy Spirit to guide our decisions and actions. It's a conscious choice to align our desires with God's purposes, indicating our obedience and trust in His wisdom and guidance. Yieldedness gives us assurance of salvation, Romans chapter 8, verse 16 reassures us, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Yieldedness gives us an inner assurance, a great conviction that we are God's children. This assurance is a beacon of hope, indicating our secure position in God's family and our eventual home in heaven. In yielding to the Holy Spirit, we open ourselves to divine transformation, allowing God to mould us into vessels of His love and grace. Yieldedness is not a one-time event, but a daily surrender, a continuous relationship with the Holy Spirit that helped direct our path to heaven. Sign number four, bearing fruits of the Holy Spirit, bearing the fruits of the Spirit, as outlined in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through to 23. Let's look into the depths of these virtues and understand how they serve as a clear indicator of our heavenly destination. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Well, firstly, let's begin by understanding what exactly the fruits of the Spirit are. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23 states that but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These virtues are not just ethical guidelines but they are the characteristics that the Holy Spirit cultivates within us as we gradually grow in our faith. Love, the greatest of all fruits love, the first fruit mentioned, holds a central place in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, which says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love is the foundation of all other fruits, reflecting God's unconditional love for us and our love for others. It's a selfless, sacrificial love that embodies Christ's teachings. Joy and peace. Inner contentment, the fruits of joy, and peace are intertwined. In Romans chapter 15, verse 13, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Joy is more profound than mere happiness. It's a deep sense of contentment and gratitude, while peace, on the other hand, is the calm assurance that comes from trusting God completely in all circumstances and situations we may find ourselves and at all times. Patience, kindness, and goodness, virtues in action. Patience, kindness, and goodness are virtues that reflect our interactions with others. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Patience allows us to endure difficulties without losing faith. Kindness and goodness drive us to help others, showing Christ's love daily through our actions, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Steadfastness in character, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are about the steadfastness of our character. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 28 reminds us, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Self-control is mastering and controlling our desires and impulses. Gentleness reflects humility and empathy. Faithfulness is our unwavering commitment to God's truth and promises. Bearing fruits as a sign of transformation when we bear these fruits of the Spirit, it signifies a transformed life. It shows that the Holy Spirit is actively working within us, shaping us into the image of Christ. This transformation is not only evidence of our faith, but also a beacon to others, drawing them towards the love and grace of God. It's like a signpost, our transformed life becomes a pointer for men to look unto God and become heaven conscious. Bearing the fruits of the Spirit is not a mere checklist of good behaviour. It's a testament to a life deeply connected with God. As we cultivate these virtues, we not only enrich our own spiritual journey, but also become instruments of God's love and grace in the world. May these fruits flourish in our lives, guiding us on the path to heaven Sign number five, love and compassion. Love and compassion, as taught by Jesus, are not just virtues. They are powerful indicators of our spiritual journey. Let's see why love and compassion are clear signs that you're on the way to heaven. Love is the greatest commandment. 
Love is the greatest commandment, as stated by Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through to 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus emphasises on the importance of love, both for God and for one another. This commandment serves as the foundation for our discussion. It's act of love. Love is not merely a feeling, but a tangible action. First John 3.18 instructs, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Our love for others should be expressed through compassionate deeds, helping those in need, and showing kindness to everyone we encounter. Love in action becomes a signpost on our transit to heaven. Compassion towards the vulnerable. Compassion, especially towards the vulnerable, is seen in Matthew chapter 25, verse 35 through to 36, where Jesus says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in for prison, and you came to visit me. Compassion towards those in need reflects our understanding of the connection of humanity and our willingness to extend God's love to all. The Parable of the Good Samaritan This parable of the Good Samaritan is found in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through to 37. It shows the essence of compassion. In this story, a Samaritan shows mercy to a wounded stranger, breaking through the social and cultural boundaries. Jesus concludes the parable by saying, Go and do likewise. This parable emphasizes the universal nature of compassion and love, regardless of our differences, and signifies our readiness for heaven. Love covers a multitude of sins. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 8 tells us, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Love has the power to heal, reconcile, and transform. When we love others deeply and forgive as we have been forgiven, we exemplify the divine love that paves our way to heaven. Love and compassion are not just emotions. They are transformative forces that shape our character and draw us closer to God. As we love God with all our hearts and love our neighbours as ourselves, we fulfil the fundamental teachings of Jesus. Let love guide your actions. Let compassion be your response. And you'll find yourself walking a path illuminated by heavenly light. These are five signs in which we can inculcate and imbibe in our lives to be sure of heaven. So if you live by these five signs, congratulations and stay on that path because you are a sure and qualified candidate of heaven.